Thank you so much, Danny. It's good to be here. It's such an honor to be here uh, this morning. So happy to see you. Uh, my wife loves the beach. I love teaching young people about Jesus. So it was a great combination. And we had a, we had a wonderful week. Uh, great, great time. Uh, before I get started this morning, I do want to thank those of you who knew about my son and have been praying for him. Uh, two days before Christmas, Zach came down with COVID. Uh, he was in a coma, medically induced coma for over a month. Uh, we were told by the doctor that he didn't hold out much hope. But God, but God had another plan. And so uh, God, uh, Zach woke up. Uh, the Lord has uh, revived him and renewed him. He came home on March 13th and he preached his first sermon. And he preached his first sermon. He's a pastor as well. He preached his first sermon on Easter Sunday. Can you believe it? And they told, he, they told us that his lungs were so damaged that he wouldn't even be able to carry on a conversation for very long, let alone preach again. And so God has done an incredible miracle and we're just so blessed and uh, and thank you for your prayers. We've seen God's prayers, uh, God's people pray uh, in a way that uh, has uh, convinced us all the more that there's nothing impossible if we pray. So thank you so much. Hey, let's get our Bibles out this morning and let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to read two verses. It's always good to be here. We love Pastor Danny and Wendy. You guys are blessed with uh, a great pastor. It's great to meet new friends and great to see old friends. So it's good to, good to be here. Matthew chapter 12. Uh, we're going to read two verses, verses 20 and 21. The title of my message, A Splint and a Flint. But before we begin, why don't we pray? Father, we thank you again for your wonderful grace toward us. Thank you for your love, Lord. Lord, we love you, but only because you first loved us. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness toward us and for your grace. And this morning, Lord, I pray for the person who's walked in here so discouraged, so bummed out, who's been looking for reasons to hope and not finding many. Lord, I pray that today, that you would minister to that heart, that you'd bring healing and help, that you bring encouragement where it's needed. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your spirit. We ask that he work among us today, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 20, Matthew quotes from Isaiah 42, a messianic psalm, and he says of Jesus, a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax, he will not quench till he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will trust. Ray and Carol Lehman reside on the east coast of the United States. One summer, they loaded up their family into a van and they drove to the west coast. And if you've ever taken one of these cross-country road trips, you know that it is a very, very, very long drive. It takes almost forever. And it is especially long when kids are in the car. Well, to break up the trip, Carol decided to have what she called a family kindness day. Each family member's name was written on a piece of paper and placed in a hat. And then everyone drew out a name. The challenge was to be as kind as possible throughout the day to the person whose name you'd drawn. And it was a great idea. All throughout the day, on the road, in the car, at the pit stops, everyone found a kind deed to do for the person to whom they'd been assigned. In fact, Carol's idea went so well that the next day her youngest son, Darrell, asked if they could do it again. Well, this time Darrell passed the hat and everybody picked out a name. And once again, the family went out of their way to pour out love on their selection. Well, it took until around lunchtime to notice a peculiarity. 
You see, little Durrell was enjoying an unprecedented amount of attention and love and kindness. Well, after a hurried investigation, it was revealed that Durrell had written his name down on all the papers that he had placed in the hat. Durrell had been hoarding the family's affections. And yet it's understandable, for we all crave kindness and love. Every one of us needs encouragement. Often we're reluctant to pass on an encouraging word for fear of giving the other person the big head. We're afraid of inflating the other guy's ego. Well, author Doug Fields proposes a litmus test to tell if a person needs to be encouraged. He concludes, if a person is breathing, they need encouragement. Life can tear us down and rough us up. It punches us drunk and slaps us silly. The world that we occupy is a discouraging place. Beatdowns occur almost daily. That's why a little encouraging can go a long way. And I've come to you this morning with words of hope. Reminds me of Hall of Fame basketball coach John Wooden. Wooden led UCLA to 10 national titles. And he had a rule on his team. Whenever a player scored a basket, he was required to wink or nod or smile at the teammate who had passed him the ball. Well, once when instructing the team about this rule, one of the new players asked, said, but coach, what if he's not looking? And Wooden replied, I guarantee you he'll look. You see, the coach knew that we're all looking for affirmation. I've heard it said, man does not live by bread alone. He also needs some buttering up. <laughs> and that's true. All human beings need daily doses of propping up. When I turned 50 years old, my wonderful wife threw me a surprise birthday party. She decorated the house with scores of colorful helium-filled balloons. It added to the festive mood. But afterwards, those same balloons were a source of sadness. For it didn't take long for the balloons to lose their helium. I mean, like the very next day. That next morning after the party, all those fun balloons were nothing but shriveled up pieces of plastic just hanging on to a string. And as pretty as a plastic balloon looks filled with helium, a deflated balloon looks that much uglier. I'll never forget sitting alone in my living room looking at those deflated balloons. And I was asking God, God, is this a metaphor for my life? Is this a prophecy, Lord? I mean, will the rest of my life be like a soaring balloon or like a shriveled up piece of plastic just hanging onto a string? I suppose the verdict is still out. But I have drawn one conclusion. As a balloon needs helium, I need encouragement. You know, today doctors hasten the healing process by performing all kinds of complex and evasive surgeries, bypasses and ectomies and transplants. But when it comes to the healing for the soul, a simple pat on the back is often the best therapy. I've heard it said, a pat on the back, though only a few vertebrae removed from a kick in the pants, is miles ahead in results. <laughs> we all desperately need to be encouraged. And our Lord comes to us with healing and help and hope. Here in Matthew chapter 12, we find a messianic prophecy that speaks to us of Jesus, of his nature. Isaiah 42 describes the Messiah in the nature of his ministry. And oh, I love Isaiah 42. Let me hit a few highlights for you before we read this. In Isaiah 42 verse 1, God says of his son and servant, I have put my spirit upon him. Verse 4, God declares of Jesus, he will not fail. Verse 6 calls him a light to the Gentiles. Verse 7 predicts that Jesus will open blind eyes and bring out prisoners from the prison house. In verse 9, we're told that Jesus will do new things. And in light of all that Isaiah 42 predicts of the Messiah, verse 10 commands all the world's nations, sing to the Lord a new song and his praise from the ends of the earth. But of all these pungent promises in Isaiah's prophecy, there is one that captures and stirs Matthew's imagination more than all the others. 
It's Isaiah 42, verse 3. It's the passage that he quotes of Jesus here in his gospel, Matthew 12, verse 20 and 21. Let me read it again. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. See, our Lord is all about encouraging, not extinguishing. To the bruised reed, he is a splint. To the smoking flax, he is a flint. Our Lord Jesus is a splint and a flint. Hey, on the banks along the Jordan River, the reeds grow high up toward the sky. These bulrushes rise upwards as much as 18 feet above the water level. The tip of the reed carries a white plume. The base can be as thick as three inches in diameter. And these reeds help with erosion control there on the riverbed. But they also have other purposes as well. The lower portion of the reed is often used as a cane or a walking stick. The thinner middle section was used to craft musical woodwinds like flutes. The slender upper portion of the reed was used to carve pens and writing tools. Reeds were almost never used as weapons. And do you know why? It's because they lacked the necessary strength. You remember when Jesus spoke of the authority and the strength of John the Baptist, he asked rhetorically, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? For unlike John, reeds are flimsy. In fact, a fragile reed swaying back and forth in the wind was a symbol for weakness. And a bruised reed was weaker still. You see, despite its intended use, a reed was useless when the stalk was bruised or crimped. It didn't even require a complete break. Just the slightest little bend in the stalk was enough for it to get uprooted and tossed aside. Since reeds grow in clumps, no one would ever take the time and make the effort to nurture back to health a single crippled reed. That would be a waste. Oh, just throw it away. Go back down to the bulrushes for another. There are plenty of other reeds to choose from. And the same was true of a smoking flax. Flax was used to make cloth. Various fabrics were made from the stalks of the flax plants. A flax is a plant that grows two to four feet high. It yields these beautiful blue uh, plumes. When harvested, the stalks are dried out. And when the stalks become parched, they're easily shredded into individual threads. The most common use for flax in Jesus' day was as wicks for oil lamps. Dry flax fiber is highly flammable. Place a thread in a bowl of olive oil, just hit it with a spark, and it easily ignites. It burns for a long, long time. The trick, though, was to keep the flax dry. If you moistened it just a little... All it would do is smolder and smoke without really catching fire. A waterlogged wick was of no use. And just like a bruised reed, you threw away a smoking flax. You could purchase dry wicks for a penny a pound. The time and effort it would take to reignite a smoldering wick was a total waste. Oh, just grab another. And here's what I think. I believe that some of you in this room this morning, living here in the 21st century, can best be described by these 2,000-year-old oriental analogies. For Jesus' words and idioms are timeless. You might not have thought in these terms when you came in today, but as you think about it now, this is how you feel inside. Man, I think I'm a bruised reed. And oh yeah. I feel like maybe I'm a smoking flax. For like a broken reed, you've been damaged. You've been bent against your will. You've been wounded. Your once tall stalk has a break. Your weakness has now become weaker. You feel like the slightest breeze could blow you over. You know you stand no chance in a windstorm. You've assumed that you're no longer fit for the purposes God once intended. You feel like it's over for you. 
It would be easier for God just to go back down to the riverbank and start over with another reed. And like smoldering flax, you're exhausted. Your enthusiasm and passion for life and for ministry and maybe even for your marriage has been doused with a million drops of disappointment. Hope for the future, your willingness to love has been extinguished. And if I could look into the furnace of your heart this morning, I would feel a coldness. I would see a few dying embers of a once roaring fire. Why would God waste time rekindling wet wood? You've assumed he prefers fresh flax. Oh, but here's what we don't realize. Jesus doesn't think the way we think. He's not so utilitarian. Hey, when Jesus builds something, he prefers to start with broken reeds. When Jesus starts a fire, he likes to use smoldering flax. Oh, friend, Jesus hasn't given up on you. Jesus is willing to invest in the bruised reed and in the smoking flax. He refuses to write them off or abandon either. He cares deeply for them both. Time used and effort spent, nurturing and healing provided is never a waste. Listen carefully. There are no throwaway people in the eyes of Jesus. Once I saw a movie about a long shot racehorse. And there's a scene where the old horse trainer, he saves an injured thoroughbred from a bullet in the head. Later he's asked why. And I love his reply. He said, you don't throw a whole life away just because he's banged up a little. Please listen to that. I'm going to read it again. You don't throw a whole life away just because he's banged up a little. You see, this is what Jesus is saying in our text. And it's not only true of old horses. It's also true of banged up people. Certainly, God created mankind to be far different than we turned out to be. When he scooped out of the ground that handful of dust to make the first man, he had perfection in mind. But then sin entered the world and life got hard and we got hurt and people got banged up a lot. But Jesus doesn't scrap the damaged goods. He doesn't haul us off to the landfill. Oh, it would be easy for Jesus to toss aside the bruised reed and the smoking flax, but that's not in his nature. See, that is not how Jesus treats people. As far as Jesus is concerned, there are no disposable people. Jesus is a huge recycler. Do you know this? Hey, Jesus started recycling a long, long time ago. He redeems and restores and reconciles and revives. These are all Bible words. Jesus breathes new life into exhausted lives. He still has plans for bruised reeds and for smoking flax. And isn't that how he treated people while he was here on this earth? I mean, the Gospels are full of such examples. Think of the woman taken in adultery. I mean, this gal had been in more laps than a napkin. In fact, she was being exploited not only by the man she slept with, but by the Pharisees who had arranged this tryst to trap Jesus. This gal was a pawn in their move to checkmate the Savior. Talk about a bruised reed. Yet Jesus, the only person in the crowd qualified to cast a stone, didn't. There was no malice in his voice. Neither do I condemn you, he said. Go and sin no more. How many times have we replayed those words in our own heads when we were guilty? Let's not forget them when the rocks are in our hands. Our Lord, he never broke a bruised reed. Think of Zacchaeus, the short guy with a long list of sins. He was an enemy collaborator, a swindler to boot. He sold out his countrymen to strong arm for Rome. And Jesus spotted Zac up a tree. What a fitting place for him to be. In a proverbial sense, Zacchaeus lived his whole life out on a limb. But Jesus called him by name invited himself to Zach's house for dinner. Zacchaeus had burned his bridges and had given up hope. He was a smoking flax if there ever was one. 
But the favor he felt from Jesus relit a spark in his cold soul. The compassion of Jesus helped this little man stand tall again. Restitution now had a reason. Just think of the Gadarean demoniac. When Jesus cast the evil spirits out of him, they immediately entered the herd of swine. They went hog wild. The demon possessed swine. They ran down the slope into the lake. You could say those demons drove the pigs to suicide. <laughs> but imagine what they'd been doing to the man, to the Gadarean. He was a bruised reed. Or what about the sinful woman who came to Jesus at the Pharisee's house? Oh, she bathed the Lord's feet with her tears and her perfume. Jesus said she had a big love because he had forgiven her a big debt. Or what about Peter's mother-in-law, racked with a fever? Or the lame man who was lured through the roof? Or Mary from Magdala, who had boarded seven demons? Or the hemorrhaging woman who grabbed his robe by faith and received virtue? Or old blind Bartimaeus, who when told to keep silent, just kept asking. Or any one of the infectious lepers who cried to be cleansed. Or Mary of Bethany, who like so many of us, was busy and tired from serving the Lord to sit at his feet and worship him. And can you name me any one of these people that Jesus turned away? Can you name me one crippled, choking soul he refused to help? No, you can't. And think of Peter. Perhaps the prime example of a bruised reed and a smoking flax. This man's faith was awfully flimsy. Even after boasting of his loyalty to Jesus three times, Peter denied his Lord in his most critical hour. Peter proved chicken before the rooster crowed. Afterwards, he was so discouraged he went fishing. He figured he just wasn't cut out for this apostlehood. Besides, Jesus wouldn't use him now anyway, not after his failure. So Peter went back to what he knew. Peter figured he could fish. But by the lake, on the beach, the risen Lord came to him and renewed his calling to a discouraged Peter. Jesus told him, feed my sheep. Hey, these are just a few examples of God's grace in action. Realize our failure is no greater than Peter's failure. And yet Jesus didn't forsake Peter, and he's sure not going to forsake you. Jesus doesn't bail on failed followers. I love Psalm 136. 26 times in 26 couplets, the psalmist repeats the phrase, His mercy endures forever. It's as if he's trying to ram it into our heads. Never give up on Jesus, for he sure hasn't given up on us. It was the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, who once commented on our text. The feeblest are not disdained by Jesus. He is patient with those who are unlovely in his eyes. Jesus longs to bind up the broken reed and fan the smoldering flax into flaming life. Oh, that poor sinners would remember this. And trust in him. Okay, poor sinner. Are you willing to trust in Jesus? See, Jesus is a bruised. Jesus is a splint to the bruised reed. Have you ever walked through a vegetable garden and seen the stalks of the tomato plants tied up to the wooden stakes? I mean, on their own, those stalks aren't strong enough to keep the ripening tomatoes from dragging the ground. They need strength and support from outside themselves. And likewise, a bent person, a person who's been nicked or scarred by this world, totters under their own weight. But Jesus is a splint. He provides support at the very point of your brokenness. He comes to your rescue at the exact place where you've been damaged and wounded. His strength holds you together long enough for you to be healed. Jesus holds you up when on your own the world would, you would fall. He wraps his strong arms around your frailty. Perhaps your injury is physical. Maybe it's emotional or relational or even spiritual. Doesn't matter. 
Jesus promises to be your splint until you grow strong again. Maybe you've been betrayed by a friend. Now it's difficult for you to trust another person. Maybe you've loved someone and were rejected and you're reluctant to love again. Maybe your marriage is wounded. You're worried your relationship will never be as strong as it once was. Maybe you've embarked on a job or a ministry opportunity that didn't go so well. Now you doubt your gifts and your callings. You're suffering a crisis of confidence. You're a bruised reed. But realize, friends, Jesus gives himself to you. He comes to you and wraps himself around you at your point of weakness. What greater gift could he give? You know, the strategy we hear today in the business world is play to your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. Oh, but Jesus has a different way. He wants you to rely on him at the very point of your weakness. Let him show himself strong on your behalf. Confess your weakness. Jesus wants to prop up and build up flimsy folk until they get sturdy again. In the words of our text, he sends forth justice to victory. Jesus is a splint to the bruised reed. And make no mistake about it, he's also a flint to the smoking flax. You know, Bears Grylls was the star of a show called Man vs. Wild. It was one of my boys' favorite TV shows. And then Bears ended up with a new survival show called Get Out Alive. It was one of my wife's favorite TV shows. I've watched a lot of Bears Grylls over the years. And one thing I've learned about surviving in the wild is that you need flint. For with that small piece of flint, you can kindle a fire. And with fire, you can cook, and you can boil water, and you can stay warm, and you can dry clothes. Life is easier with fire. Every survivalist is excited to have fire. <laughs> and the same is true spiritually. A life or a ministry or even a marriage without spiritual fire, without the fires of enthusiasm and joy and motivation and love and commitment and passion and hope. A life without fire can be very difficult. Hey, to survive in the wild of this world, you need fire. Imagine two different rooms on a cold, frosty night. The first room has a roaring fire in the fireplace. The family's all gathered around the hearth. Everyone enjoys the smells and slight and warmth of the fire. But now picture in your mind another room. On this chilly night, the fireplace is empty. Folks walk through this room, but it's not a living room. Far from it. No one lives in this room. There's no warmth or light to attract people to stay. Why? Because there's no fire. And what I've described are not just two rooms, but two lives. One life contains the flame of God. The Holy Spirit lives inside this person. And people are attracted to their love and their warmth and the light that they sense. But the other life is cold and empty and lonely. There's no life in this room because there's no fire. There's nothing to attract other people to come and stay here. You see, our tendency is to walk off from the room that's cold and empty. Why would anybody want to hang out there? But Jesus refuses to leave such a life. He stays with the cold and empty person. He refuses to abandon him or her. He intends to build a fire. For Jesus has flint. Jesus is the spark that can relight the fires of enthusiasm. You know, at times it's hard to start a fire. You have to prime it. Show it some patience. Be persistent with it. But those are all tasks that Jesus is good at. He is an expert at rekindling fire. And not only can Jesus relight a fire in your heart, he can do the same in your marriage or with a friendship or for a confidence. Jesus will take smoldering kindling, just a flicker of a flame, and he'll fan it back to a full-blown blaze. Jesus can reignite a ministry that had nearly died out. 
He can revive the dream or the vision that had almost faded. He can reestablish a respect smothered by failure. Jesus specializes in rekindling burned out people. Do you remember what John the Baptist said of Jesus? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus is the Lord of the spark. He fires up new life. And understand the spiritual warfare that surrounds this ministry of Jesus that I've been describing to you. See, our Lord is a splint and a flint, whereas our enemy is a harsh wind and a wet blanket. You see, Satan's nature is just the opposite of Jesus. Let me warn you. Satan has the killer instinct. And do you understand what I mean when I say the killer instinct? I mean, such a person doesn't just want to beat their opponent. They want to punish them in the process. When he falls down, the goal is to finish him off. A football player with the killer instinct doesn't just tackle the quarterback. He tries to disable him and put him out of the game. And Satan has this kind of killer instinct. Satan doesn't just bend the reed or break its skin. He's the fierce wind that blows in to tear it in two. Satan doesn't just let the fire die down. He's the wet blanket. He's the bucket of water that snuffs out the coals. And if it weren't for Jesus, Satan would work his cruelty on us. There'd be no hope for recovery. Our first failure would be fatal. But Jesus keeps hope alive. He really does. Do you ever suffer from inexplicable moodiness? Or is this just me? I mean, one day you're soaring, the next day you're depressed. Happens to me every Monday. It amazes me how vulnerable I am to the highs and lows, to the ebbs and the flows. A lot can cause this disturbance, but have you ever considered that a main cause could be spiritual? That wave of encouragement followed by a wave of despair may be the result of spiritual warfare. When a bout with the blues strikes at a strange time and for no apparent reason, there may actually be a spiritual battle raging to sink your faith. Discouragement isn't always traceable to discernible, obvious causes. The enemy of our soul loves to ambush our feelings. But likewise, encouragement can also rise up and roll in over us in the same sort of mysterious manner. Not long ago, my sons and I, we burned some debris in the meadow below our house. It was a huge fire. It kind of got, got out of our hands a little bit. We got, we got kind of carried away. I mean, they, neighbors wanted to call the fire department. Late in the afternoon, I had to do something about it. And so I doused this big blaze with water. And it was... Two full days later, two days, mind you, I noticed smoke rising again from the meadow. I couldn't believe that that fire still had life. But you see, the wind had kicked up, and it had stirred up a spark, and it had reignited those smoldering ashes. And you see, this is what Jesus does in a believing heart. Even when there's no visible reason to be optimistic, even when a positive outlook isn't tied to anything tangible, even when you've seen it all burn out before your very eyes, hope can swoop in. Even when the doctor calls you and tells you there's no hope for your son. If you believe, it's amazing what Jesus wants to do. The Holy Spirit still blows like a rushing mighty wind. He's dispatched from the throne of grace and the spirit of Jesus comes to us like a splint and like a flint. You see, the starting point for you and I comes at the end of our text. Notice the last line that we read here. Isaiah said, in his name, Gentiles will trust. And here's what I've got to ask you. Do you trust Jesus? Do you really trust Jesus? Not just in the macro sense, but in the micro sense. You know, years ago when I was at the university in pursuit of a business degree, 
I had to take two courses in economics, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Well, macro deals with the big picture. It involves market trends and government regulation and the health of the overall economy, whereas micro is very specific. It deals with the choices that individuals and specific companies make. And let me suggest that there is such a thing as macro and micro faith. You see, macro faith looks at universal issues, while micro faith examines matters that are specific to me. You see, macro faith embraces the overarching truths of Christianity. There is a God. His son is Jesus. He died to save me. He's alive today. The Bible is God's word. But you see, there's also such a thing as micro faith. And this is the faith that I exhibit in the nitty gritty circumstances of my life. Do I let Jesus influence my thoughts or the world? Do I obey him in my finances? Do I lean on him for my emotional needs or do I run off and give myself to others? Do I trust in Jesus in the day-to-day challenges of my life? Oh, both macro and micro are important. You could say it like this. My eternal salvation depends on macro faith while my internal salvation depends on micro faith. See, a bruised reed and a smoking flax needs a specific, targeted faith. We need to trust Jesus day by day. I'm sure you have macro faith, but my question to you this morning is what about the micro faith? Are you trusting Jesus at the exact point of your break, of that wound, right where the mending and the healing needs to occur? At the very moment when the fire is about to smolder and die, that's when your faith needs to kick in. 2,000 years ago, a man was rejected and beaten and crucified and buried. And yet three days later, he rose from the dead, never to die again. You believe that, but you see the empty tomb is proof of so much more. For Jesus can resurrect a deadness in your life. Right now, your back is against the wall. You face what seems to be insurmountable problems. You're looking for reasons to hope but not finding many. Friend, that's why you need to look again at that empty tomb. Jesus, too, was a damaged reed. He became cold embers for us. Are you telling me your problems are greater than the hardships that Jesus faced? Certainly not. Yet in the end, our Lord triumphed over our arch enemy, sin and death. And now with that victory under his belt, nothing is impossible for Jesus. And Jesus will work miracles in your life if you trust him. Understand, your discouragement isn't a big deal. In the grand scheme, it's tiny. It's the size of a mere coin, just a quarter, just that size, just a speck. In contrast, Jesus is larger than the sun. He shines brighter. The warmth he generates is more powerful. Oh, but here's what can happen. If I hold that coin up close to my eyeball, it can block out the sun, can it? To me, at that moment, this little coin becomes larger than the sun itself. If I allow it, a tiny coin can block out the enormous sun. And in the same way, a small but well-placed speck of discouragement can devastate our faith. If we're going to walk in victory, we can't allow discouragement to ever get between our eyes and God's son. Once there was a dad and his little boy, they were planning a fishing trip. Oh, for weeks, it's all the son could talk about. They were planning to leave the very next day. Excitement had been building and building in this little boy. Well, the night before the big trip, dad was tucking his son into bed. When the little boy looked up into his father's face and he said to him, Daddy, thank you for tomorrow. And you see, this is what faith says. Lord, thank you for tomorrow. 
for Jesus rose again to be there in your tomorrow. Even when your strength fails, even when your passion fades, Jesus promises to be there in your tomorrow. A bruised reed, he will not break. Smoking flax, he will not quench. Hey, this is how Jesus treats us. All that's left is for us to trust in him.